We all know and love carbon fibre. Well, OK, we all, we all know it. And as this century's wonder material, it's kind of hard to avoid. And it's impossible to ignore its massive potential. Everything from golf clubs, tennis rackets, Formula One cars, fighter jets, and of course, my favourite, bikes, are all made from carbon fibre. It's influenced our lives everywhere and in places that we probably don't even notice. A couple of years ago, we made a really cool video with the help of Look, where we visited their bike factory and learnt how carbon fibre is used to manufacture bicycles. And a lot of people commented on that video, uh, wanting to know in greater detail about the material that's used to manufacture the bikes. So that is exactly what we're going to do. Because, I mean, how many people actually know what carbon fibre is or where it comes from, how it's made and what it's made from? And also, why is it so expensive? Well, you know what time it is. It's time for some GCN Does Science. Time now for chemistry time, specifically organic chemistry, which is the chemistry of carbon and its molecules, which is handy because that's what my PhD is in. I knew it would come in handy one day. Carbon is blooming everywhere. All life on Earth is made from carbon, and also things like diamond, graphite, and, well, carbon fibre. And what makes it such a versatile and amazing element is that it can form four other bonds, four other chemical bonds with other atoms. Now, these bonds can be with other carbon atoms, in the case of diamond, and graphite, but they can also be with things like oxygen and sulfur and nitrogen and hydrogen, in the case of DNA, which makes us, and in the case of plastics too, or to give them their technical name, polymers. When you burn something that contains carbon, you get black stuff a lot of the time, which, if I blow that up, oh, you get black stuff, which is charcoal. Charcoal is basically pure carbon. So how do you go from this black stuff and turn it into a bike frame? Well, you don't. What actually happens is they take propene gas and they do a chemical reaction with ammonia. Both of these are naturally occurring compounds. Ammonia, that's found in your wee, and propene, is found in fossil fuels and natural gas. This chemical reaction happens in massive factories, and the result is this stuff, acrylonitrile. This is the building block of carbon fibre, and it's a liquid that's said to smell like onions. But don't drink it, because it'll probably alkylate your DNA, which is chemistry nerd for bad news. Anyhow, you take your liquid acrylonitrile and you react it with itself using a chemical reaction called free radical polymerization. Now to do this you add a very small amount of a catalyst called an initiator and that causes all the individual molecules of acrylonitrile to stick together in long chains. To make this a bit easier to understand, think of each molecule of acrylonitrile as a drunk human being at a wedding party. Next you add your special chemical initiator for the sake of argument, that can be your annoying drunk uncle that nobody really likes. Now, the annoying drunk uncle initiates a conga line, whereby everyone has to join up in a line, in a chain reaction that just grows and grows and grows and gets longer and longer and longer. That's basically what's happening. At this point, I would love to demonstrate a conga with my fellow GCM presenters, but unfortunately, because of social distancing, I can't. Is there anything more tragic than a solo conga? Now these long chains of acrylonitrile are now a polymer called polyacrylonitrile. Poly means many. And 90% of the carbon fibre we know and love, I love, is made in this way. Now some of the other 10% is made in a process using coal tar and pitch. And this is more expensive and results in super, super stiff fibres with a really low thermal coefficient of expansion. I don't need to know what that means. I mean, we don't really need to know what that means. All you need to know, this bonus fact, is that this stuff is used in spaceships and not bikes. 
Sticking briefly with that conga analogy, additives can be added into the conga lines in order to tweak the material properties of those acrylonitrile strands. And this is dependent on the final purpose of the carbon fibre that's being made, you know, whether it's for bikes or trains or whatever. Now, of course, this is a gross oversimplification of what is a pretty complex process, but hopefully you get the idea. The polyacrylonitrile, or teeny tiny conga lines, if that's easier, are then drawn out into fibres or strands and wound onto big bobbins. Think of this as like, well, cotton reels. They're then spread out in an oven and heated in the presence of air to about 200 or 300 degrees Celsius in order to oxidise them. And this part of the process is really, really important. And to demonstrate how important it is, I've got a really expensive prop. Check this out. Going back to my favourite conga analogy, what happens is you get multiple conga lines and get them to line up next to each other parallel. You then get them to join hands, cross-linking those lines together, and this makes it really, really strong. Why is this important? Well, this is a carrier bag. It's made from carbon, much like carbon fiber, but it's made from polyethylene and it doesn't have that cross-linking going on. And as a result, it's strong in one direction, but it'll tear in another. By cross-linking the fibers, it increases the fiber density and makes it strong. The next part of the process is called carbonization. And what they do is take the strands of carbon fiber and then put them in special ovens that heat them to a thousand degrees Celsius or more. And this is done without the presence of oxygen. This is to stop the fibers from burning. The high heat and lack of oxygen causes the carbon strands to vibrate and some of the chemical bonds to non-carbon atoms start to break, releasing those non-carbon atoms. And this also creates greater interlocking of the strands together again. And the actual mechanism by way this happens isn't actually fully understood by scientists, but they know it works. It improves the crystalline structure of the carbon. And essentially what you're making is strands of graphite. The interesting thing about carbonization is it largely determines the modulus of the carbon fiber. Higher modulus carbon fibers are stiffer and ultra high modulus carbon fiber is stiffer still, but they're more expensive. And the reason for this is that they require a longer cooking time in the oven and also higher temperatures to achieve that higher modulus. As with the carbonization process, what happens is the fibers lose weight, they lose volume and they shrink in diameter as the non-carbon atoms are expelled and you're getting like this kind of purer carbon fiber. It's a bit like wringing out a dishcloth. This is proper high modulus now. <laughs> high modulus dishcloth. Now having carbon fibers on their own isn't great. I mean they're super strong and have high tensile strength but they're also quite brittle so that's where the resin comes in or to give it its technical name the matrix. And, and no, I, I don't mean like bullet time, neo, kung fu, all that stuff, unfortunately. Carbon fiber is a composite material. And composite materials are where you take two or more materials, combine them together so that you can combine their physical properties to make a new super material. Now, a great example of a composite material is reinforced concrete. You've got the steel wires surrounded by a matrix of concrete, and it's much stronger than just, well, steel wires on their own or standard concrete. And carbon fiber is much the same, just on a smaller scale. You've got the carbon fiber wires surrounded by resin, which is the matrix. This process isn't very simple either. Firstly, they need to rough up the surface of the carbon fibers, and they usually do this by dragging them through baths of nitric acid. Now, think of this as when you've got an inner tube and you want to repair it with a puncture repair kit. The first thing you do is take some sandpaper and rough up the surface, and this is to help improve the adhesion or sticking of what you're gonna stick to, well, the object, in this case an inner tube, but in the case of carbon fibre, the fibres. 
With the fibre surface roughed up, a special coating called sizing is then applied. This is used to help protect the fibres so that they can be handled and processed more easily further down the line. Now at this point, the fibre is ready to be sent out either to weavers on big bobbins, uh, big like giant cotton reels of fibre, or the sheets to pre-preggers. And the pre-preggers apply the resin, the matrix, to these sheets. And from there, it then goes on to factories like the Look Factory, where we saw it arriving in massive sheets. Now, the resins that are applied to carbon fibre are quite kind of secretive, and they differ depending on the final intended use of that carbon fibre, but most carbon fibre used in the bike industry uses epoxy-based resins. A pre-preg sheet of carbon is the carbon fibre with the resin pre-impregnated into the sheet, and this is how most bike manufacturers make their frames, and it's what can be seen in the look video that we made as well. These sheets are then cut out into giant jigsaw pieces and assembled into the shape of a bike. I should point out, though, that there is another way, and this is used by some specialist manufacturers like Time or Team and Lightweight, based in Friedrichshafen. And they weave or filament wind carbon fibre, so they take just strands of carbon fibre with no resin in it, and then they weave it into the shape they want. And as this weaving is happening, they're also applying resin. Now, I was told when I visited the Lightweight factory a few years ago that this can result in a more efficient amount of resin in the matrix, basically less, but as much as you need, uh, resulting in, well, higher quality carbon fibre, according to them. But this process is more expensive. So that's where carbon fibre comes from and how it gets to the bike manufacturing stage. And incredibly, this is a process that's taken over 30 years to develop. And in terms of producers of this stuff, well, there aren't many. By far the biggest is a Japanese company based in Tokyo called Torre. They actually make the carbon fibre that's in my Pinarello F12. But there's also Hexel based in Stamford, Connecticut, Mitsubishi in Sacramento, California, uh, and a whole host of others, such as SGL Carbon based in Weisbaden, Deutschland. So what about the future then? How can carbon fibre be improved? Well, we could develop higher performing resins and higher performing fibres. Material scientists would love to use carbon nanotubes as the fibres in carbon fibre. These are much stronger than the pan-based fibres that we use at the moment. Think of them as sheets of graphite that have been rolled into tubes. They're incredibly strong. If you made your bike from these, it would be bulletproof. If you made a t-shirt out of these, it'd be bulletproof. You could even apparently, according to scientists, make a space elevator from them. They're that strong. Um, I haven't made that up. You can look it up after you've watched the video. It's true. But the problem is that we haven't yet developed a large scale, cost effective, you know, scalable way of manufacturing them in high volume, in a large size that can actually be physically weaved or woven into objects. Also, they're looking at making the process of manufacturing much greener. So rather than using ammonia and propene as your starting materials, which aren't very nice and certainly not very green or good for the environment, they're looking at using biological precursors such as lignin, which is fibre found in plants and stuff like celery. It's made of carbon and you can see the fibres in it. So using that as a starting material, cool. I also research into making carbon fibre recyclable too, because at the moment it isn't. But that's a topic for a whole nother video. Right, I hope you've enjoyed this video and it's answered some of your questions on the origins of carbon fibre. And if you like GCN Does Science videos uh, and you'd like us to do more, let us know in the comments and perhaps suggest things that you'd like us to do them on. This is a massive topic and definitely one that's too big for one video. So I hope you appreciate my efforts to condense it down and also explain it in a way that hopefully non-scientists can understand as well. Now, I've got to go though now because uh, otherwise I'll be late for uh, library practice and uh, chess club. Hey, yeah. <sighs>